Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm your host, Peggy Mello. Today's guest is Dr. Mark Friedman, a podiatrist practicing in Albany, New York. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, why don't we start out by talking about uh, your background and um, your practice? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, I'm a podiatrist. Um, I'm originally from Syracuse and I went to college at the University of Buffalo. And after that, I attended the Pennsylvania College of Podiatric Medicine, which is a four-year um, program after uh, your undergraduate's completed, <coughs> following which I did a two-year uh, surgical residency through the VA system in Kansas City. Okay. Uh, came back to Albany and started a private practice. Okay. So just so people understand the amount of training that a podiatrist has to go through uh, to become certified. Right. Um, when I finished my residency, um, uh, I, I went through a board certification process, and um, d during the, you have to have completed a surgical residency in order to sit for a written exam, which makes you board qualified. Mm -hmm. And then you, after you accumulate a certain amount of cases, you can sit for an oral examination. Uh, and once you pass that, you become board certified. And now I'm a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the anatomy of the foot. You've brought a model in, mm -hmm. so why don't you um, <laughs> teach us about the foot? Sure. The foot is a complex structure. Um, it consists of 26 bones, and there's 33 joints, and over 100 muscles and tendons come into play into your foot. Um, we typically divide the foot into the forefoot, which is the metatarsals and the phalanges, the midfoot, and then the rear foot. Um, there's a lot of different aspects we talk about when it comes to anatomy of the foot. There's the biomechanics mm -hmm. that come into play. Um, we see a, some feet where they're fl a flat foot, where they could be pronated, where the arch does that, the arch tends to collapse. Right. Or we can see a high arch or supinated foot where the arch tends to be very high. Okay. And I read that the two feet contain a quarter of the bones in the body. That is true. That's pretty incredible. It is. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> and, interesting uh, facts. There's a few things that I read online. Um, walking puts up to 1.5 times your body weight on your foot. Your feet log approximately 1,000 miles per year. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And as shock absorbers, feet cushion up to 1 million pounds of pressure during one hour of strenuous exercise. That's pretty incredible. incredible. Yeah, it is. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> there's, a, you know, there's a tremendous amount of injuries that can occur as a result of all that pounding on your feet. Um, you know, we see a lot of aches and pains, and uh, uh, a lot of deformities within the foot can make the foot less efficient. And when it's less efficient, you can imagine all that pounding um, can lead to injuries and trauma. Okay. And in general, what do you have to say about pain in the foot? Um, in general, uh, you know, no pain is normal. A lot of people That's say, good. oh, you know, it's just my foot, it hurts a little bit, I don't need to see a doctor for this. But there's doctors that take care of foot pain and can manage foot pain. And if you're having a problem, there's no reason to live with it. You know, we see people that have had pain for, you know, six months to six years before they come in to see the doctor. You know, other pains, you get a pain in your chest, you're in the doctor's office pretty quickly. Right. Uh, the pain in the foot, you let it go for years. But in reality, if you can get that taken care of, it'll just make it that much easier for you to go about your day. I would think it'd be one kind of thing where people would just say, well, I'm going to wait and see if it gets better on its own without mm. getting an x-ray, without seeking mm. medical attention. Right. And in some cases, you may be okay with that, but in some cases, you could actually be making the problem worse. So always better to seek medical treatment. Okay, now one of the things that I guess you have a, a focus on in your practice is um, diabetic patients. So you want to talk about how diabetes affects the foot and the body? Yes. Um, 
about a third of my patients are diabetic. It's sort of become a, a very big part of my practice. Mm -hmm. um, diabetes is one of these conditions that can affect your whole body. Um, can affect your eyes, can affect your kidneys, uh, can affect your skin. As far as your feet, there's two things that we worry about as a podiatrist. The first thing that we worry about is peripheral neuropathy, mm -hmm. which is numbness in your feet. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing we worry about is peripheral vascular disease, which is poor circulation in your feet. And it's really the combination of both of those things that causes most of the problems in diabetics. Um, if a patient, um, and I should say also that most of these things typically occur when the sugar is running high. You know, if I see a diabetic and they say, "Oh, my sugar always runs good. It's you know, it's around 100 or so," um, these patients are well controlled and they're not likely to develop some of those complications of diabetes. Um, but if I see a patient who says, "Oh, my you know, my sugar is not really well controlled. I don't check it that much. Um, their sugars are you know, 175 and up." Um, they're more likely to develop problems such as neuropathy or poor circulation. The problem with neuropathy, which is basically numbness, mm -hmm. um, is common sense stuff. I mean, you could step on a thumbtack, you could step on a piece of glass and maybe not even feel it. Mm -hmm. uh, you could clip your toenails incorrectly and cut your skin and not even feel it uh, and cause an open sore. Okay. The other problem, which is poor circulation, then comes into play because if you do get a cut on your toe or on the bottom of your foot, your body needs to send white blood cells down to your foot to heal that cut or heal that infection. Mm -hmm. And if the if the circulation is not good, those blood cells, those white blood cells, can't get down there to heal the cut or heal the infection. And even if you go on antibiotics, sometimes those antibiotics can't get down there because the circulation is not good. So mm -hmm. diabetic neuropathy mixed with peripheral vascular disease is sort of the double whammy in diabetic foot disease that causes a lot of the uh, problems we see in diabetics in their feet, such as, you know, amputations, which is the worst case scenario. Right. So um, you had offered two photos for us to look at. Mm -hmm. um, you want to just talk about the two photos? Sure. Um, the first photo that I had was um, of a patient's shoe, actually, and he came in to see me and he said he had some nagging discomfort on the bottom of his foot. He couldn't really place what it was, and uh, we took a look at his foot and he had a puncture wound on the bottom of his foot. And we, you can see when you look at the picture, uh, we looked closely at the patient's sneaker and he had stepped on a nail and the nail was sticking up through the sole of the sneaker and he was walking on it oh for a good gosh. portion of the day and because he had diabetic neuropathy, he couldn't feel it. Wow. And it left him with a, a wound that was very slow to heal and there was potential for infection. So um, that just, it just really illustrates the point of some of these diabetics just can't feel the bottoms of their feet. Mm. Okay. And the second photo is an ulcer right. in the toe. Um, one of the complications of diabetic uh, of diabetes in the feet, it, um, stemming from the neuropathy and the poor circulation, is uh, diabetic ulcers. And what some people may think is a corn or a callus or a blister um, can frequently be an ulcer. And what we do in the office is if we shave down that skin where there's a callus, we can see an open sore underneath there. And that is a real serious problem because wow. the diabetic may not feel it, but there's actually an, you know, an open portal into his body and bacteria can get in there and cause all sorts of infection. You can imagine there's all sorts of bacteria around your feet. So um, you know, ulcers are one of the big things that we see in our practice with our diabetics. And there's, you know, we do all sorts of wound care and there's some advanced wound care products now that we're, we're utilizing to help heal wounds faster. Mm -hmm. Um, in some cases, we do surgery to help heal wounds, but you know, any open sore in a diabetic, that cannot be left untreated. That needs to be seen by a doctor. Okay. So if someone um, has diabetes, how often should they see a podiatrist just to check on their feet? Right. I, well, I would recommend you know, anybody with diabetes go to the podiatrist at least once. You know, mm -hmm. Get acclimated with a doctor. Have somebody look at your foot because you, know, you may think you're a diabetic without any potential problems, but um, we can tell a lot more if we look at your feet and we can, you know, we can point out some things that could be potential problems down the road if they're not a problem now. You know, if the diabetic patient's perfectly healthy, you know, they may just want to stop in maybe once a year or maybe not even that often. 
mo some of our diabetics who are you know, have pretty significant diabetes, or if certainly if they have a neuropathy or mm -hmm. poor circulation, they usually come to the office like every two months. And it may be something as simple as routine, you know, foot care, helping them with their nails or corns and calluses. But that's something we don't want them to do themselves because mm -hmm. it can lead to problems in a compromised patient. Hmm. Okay, so we've done diabetes. Let's talk about um, sports injuries. What are the common injuries that are sports related mm -hmm. in the foot? And this is another aspect of, of my practice and most podiatrist practice. Uh, you know, there's that one third that's diabetic, and um, the other stuff is, you know, healthy guys, that, guys and girls that are out there and they're doing sports and they're having injuries with their feet, um, aches and pains in their feet and things don't feel quite right. Um, we can see a variety of, of sports injuries, whether it be ankle sprains, which we see quite a few of, mm -hmm. uh, real common in basketball players and, and, and you know, any type of athlete really, you know, ankle pain, we see a lot of ankle sprains. Um, there's different <coughs> excuse me, there's different types of uh, tendon injuries that we can see or tendonitis. Um, and then we have a lot of runners that we see in our practice also, and oftentimes we're making custom orthotics for those patients, um, you know, which are like custom arch supports that go inside their shoe to provide better support when they're running. Hmm. So what about um, trauma? to the foot. Mm -hmm. Do you get a lot of fractures? We, we do see trauma in the foot also. Um, you know, we, you know this, this time of year we see a lot of injuries in the toes, particularly with people that are wearing flip-flops flip because, you know, it's just not a lot of su support in those and it's all open toe and uh, there can be damage to the toes. Uh, we do see metatarsal fractures also. Um, in our athletes, we tend to see more of the um, metatarsal fractures or sometimes a Jones fracture on the side of the foot. Um, and sometimes these are treated surgically and sometimes they're treated conservatively with casts and crutches and cam walkers and things like that. Hmm. All right, and you have um, a photo that you were showing us. Um, right. This you want to talk about that? A fifth sure. metatarsal fracture. That's right. That was that's actually, the pinky toe. Uh, yeah, that's actually <laughs> the bone right behind that pinky toe is your uh -huh. metatarsal bone. And um, that area can be commonly fractured. And this was a patient who had something uh, dropped on their foot, and there was a, uh, a fracture right at the metatarsal. And I, and I <coughs> excuse me, I submitted that photo because I thought it would just be really easy to pick out for viewers at home to see the, where that fracture is. Mm -hmm. Are toes generally um, buddy taped? Sometimes we'll do that, yeah, with um, digital fractures or toe fractures. Patients will come in, oftentimes we'll put like a little cotton between the two toes and tape them together, and it just sort of splints it a little bit in a better position for toe fractures. Sometimes we'll recommend a more rigid shoe uh, or a fracture shoe that doesn't bend so much so it keeps the toes more straight. Um, and in severe fractures, we will do surgery on toes even, uh, you know, where we can go in and, you know, realign it and maybe even run a, uh, a wire through the toe to splint it if it's a severe fracture. Hmm. Yeah. So let's say um, someone has a fractured foot and they're in a cast and they have to use crutches. Do you have any um, tips on how, how to deal with crutches? Um, you know, that's... Uh, it's always difficult for people. They think it's going to be really easy when they get on crutches for the first time, and it does require some upper body strength. Um, I would just make sure that you're fitted properly for the crutches, and if there's any concern, I would you know contact either your doctor or even a physical therapist to help you be fit for the crutches. Hmm. Okay. So um, next we talk about bunions and mm -hmm. toe pain. Do you want to describe um, what a bunion is and how it can be treated? Sure. Let me get my handy foot model. Um, a bunion is one of the more common deformities that we see in the foot, and it's one of the more common surgeries that we do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, a bunion is an enlargement of the first metatarsal head. Um, here we can see the first metatarsal, and this is the head of the first metatarsal. Okay. Um, and what happens is this will protrude out the side of the foot, and it'll often look red and swollen, and it's mm -hmm. painful if you touch it. Um, more, more common in women than men, mostly because of the shoes that women wear and the high heels and the narrow toe box that sort of push that big toe over. Oh. Um, some patients will complain of pain on the bump when you touch it. Some people will complain of pain deeper inside the joint. And there's all different levels of severity. You know, in my office, I try to keep it simple. We, we typically will grade them as mild, moderate, or severe. Okay. 
you know, mild, there may be a little bump there, more moderate, um, a bigger bump. And if you look at the x-ray, really what we're looking at on the x-ray, and the most important part of a bunion, is the space between the first and the second metatarsal. Because if that space gets too big, that bunion juts out too, more than it should. And what we do surgically is try to decrease that space and bring it back straighter. So a more moderate bunion has a bigger space, and a severe bunion will have a really big space. And as that bit space gets bigger, the big toe drifts over like that. Oh, okay. So um, you are supplying us with a photo of a patient right. with, I guess you would consider her to be a severe yeah. bunion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk I mean, about... And this wasn't even a woman that we operated on, but I just happened to take a photo because it was such a severe bunion. Um, and it's interesting because some patients will come in with a mild bunion and say this thing is killing me. And some people will come in with a severe bunion like the one in the photo and you know she's been living with it for you know 70 years and it doesn't bother her. So hmm. you know if a patient's totally asymptomatic, you know, we're pretty much going to leave it alone. Um, but there's you know like I said mild, moderate or severe mm -hmm. and our treatments are usually based on, you know, the degree of severity. So in a mild bunion, sometimes we can just shave the bump down a little bit and we can release some of the soft tissues to rebalance the toe and get it straighter. In a more moderate bunion, we do the same thing, but in addition, we usually make a cut or an osteotomy at the metatarsal head and slide it over and hold that in place with a screw. And that gives a longer lasting correction. Uh, oftentimes, if, well, what can happen is if you do a, uh, if you shave down the bump and you don't realign the joint, you haven't addressed the underlying etiology of the problem and you're more liable to get a Let's recurrence. Go you got it. Hmm. And then in a severe bunion, we have to make that cut, but we make that osteotomy or that cut in the bone way back at the base of the metatarsal and swing the entire metatarsal head over, uh, which uh, increases the uh, amount of uh, post-op time healing. Hmm. Yeah. All right, and then we have um, two photos to show okay. um, that are before and after uh, of the of the bunion surgery. Right. 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 Um, do you want to just quickly just talk about those two photos? Sure. And this was just a uh, 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 some X-rays that I grabbed from my office of a bunionectomy that I did recently. Uh, it was more of a moderate type bunion like I had talked about mm -hmm. and what we did is we shaved down the bump where the bunion was and then we made it cut across the metatarsal head, sli slid it over, held it in place with the screw That's and great. we rebalanced some of the soft tissues to make the toe straighter. You can see on the post-op x-ray um, the space between the first and the second metatarsal has closed down and, and those metatarsal bones are more parallel now okay. and you can see the screw in place. And uh, yeah, the patient did very well. Typically something like that, we may use crutches for a week or two and then usually a post-op shoe uh, for until about week four. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk about calluses. I know that that's also okay. a common mm -hmm. foot ailment, right. isn't it? That's right. And, um, you know, and sometimes we'll see those with bunions because what happens with a bunion is this, this joint here becomes somewhat unstable because of the bunion. So it pops up in the air when you walk and then the second metatarsal, which is right here, it carries more weight than it should. So you oh. get increased pressure on the bottom of the foot. And any time you have increased pressure, you can have a callus that's, that forms because that increased pressure creates friction and that friction causes that callus to form. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can see it with a bunion, we can see it with tip, very commonly with a hammer toe. If you have a toe that's instead of perfectly flat, it's kind of up in the air a little bit, you can imagine that's going to rub against your shoe back and forth all day and create another right. spot of friction and you get that corn that develops. Um, the corns, you know, initially the skin sort of is reacting and trying to protect itself, but after a period of time, it's like walking with a pebble in your shoe and it becomes very painful. Hmm. In the office, typically what we'll do is trim those down and it's, trim, it's much more comfortable for the patient immediately afterwards. The problem is the, deform, the underlying deformity is still there, so it comes back. So the way we try to get, we try to eliminate the pressure in that area, and we do that with either a wider toe box shoe or even like a gel corn pad over the toe, or um, you know, in some cases, surgery to straighten the toe so it eliminates that hot spot for the patient. Hmm. Okay. Now the next thing would be warts. Uh huh. How do you deal with those? Yeah, do you and think warts. 
Go ahead. Do you do you believe in the treatments that are over the counter um, in the grocery stores? Yeah, or? I think I think they're okay in a real mild case, or I think they really work best if you have a wart on your finger, uh, or on the hand, or anywhere else other than the bottom of the foot. The bottom of the foot is the thickest skin in the human body, and warts are just within the outer layer of the skin. They're just within the epidermis, uh, but that epidermis is very thick on the bottom of the foot. On your, on your fingers, not so thick, so a little over-the-counter remedy sometimes does the trick. Mm. On the bottom of the foot, you really need to uh, debride or trim away all that callus tissue as much as you can and really mm. expose the wart. Uh, and then we usually put a combination of chemicals on the wart in our office, and, um, and they need to re be repeated two or three times in order to really eradicate the problem. But, you know, a wart is caused by a virus. Uh, it's important to note that because, like anything, they can spread. You know, I've seen patients with one wart, and I've seen patients with, you know, 30 warts on, on, her, on their feet. And you really want to take care of these before, you know, they spread and get worse. So you're saying your people are taking care of the outside with their treatment, topical treatment, but not dealing with the root of it. Yeah, it's probably very difficult to completely eradicate a planter's wart with the over-the-counter remedies. Hmm. Um, yeah. All right, let's and there's some other prescription products that we can sometimes use in addition to what we're doing in the office. Okay. Um, why don't we talk about um, nail and skin issues with okay. feet? What about athlete's foot? Um, athlete's foot is uh, very common. We see it in kids. We see it in people that work out. Uh, we see it in people that sweat a lot, you know. Uh, athlete's foot is a fungus infection of the skin. Um, usually we see that uh, between the toes, most commonly between the fourth and the fifth toe. And the reason being is that if you look at your foot, there's a little bit of space between your first and second toes. Mm -hmm. But on your fourth and fifth toes, those toes tend to squish together a little bit and no air gets in between there. Oh. And when there's no air, it becomes a warm, dark, moist environment and it, it's a breeding ground for fungus. And that's why we see athlete's foot usually appears as like some raw skin in between the toes. Patients complain of itching or burning. And the good news is it's treated very effectively with just topical um, um, antifungals. And that's one of the con conditions where you could try an over-the-counter like Lamisil cream or Lotrimin cream. Um, there's some prescription strength uh, products that we can use also for you know, more resistant cases. Hmm. And then another, uh, at, we can also see it between the toes, but you can also see it on the bottoms of the foot. That's called a moccasin type distribution uh, where we'll see you know, dry scaling skin all along the perimeter of the foot. Some of these patients have very dry cracked heels also and that's, that, there's a fungal involvement to that. And then, as far as nails are concerned, um, fungus infection can uh, get into the nails. That's called onychomycosis, which is a, a fungal infection of the nail, and it's very, very common. Um, basically, the nail will appear thick or yellow or discolored, kind of like that picture that we saw earlier. Yeah. And um, that, unfortunately, is very difficult to treat with topicals. There are some topicals that have been shown to work somewhat. Um, but there's some pills out there that probably are the most effective for that. Um, but they're not for everybody. You know, we, we'd have to talk about the patient's medical history for, before mm. they went on a pill for like that. Now, when we talk about um, cool, <coughs> dark environments in the foot, right. is it true I read that there are 250,000 sweat glands in the human foot? <laughs> yes. And do we really sweat a pint a day from our feet? Uh, I don't know about a pint, but that, that's probably true because there are a lot of sweat glands down there and you're in a warm, dark, you know, moist environment in your shoe and your sneaker and uh, some people have, most people have no problem with it, but some people do have a problem with increased sweating in their feet. That's called hyperhidrosis. Um, and there's some prescription powders and antiperspirants that you can use on the foot for that. Hmm. Yep. Okay. So what about um, tendinitis? What if you have a problem with a tendon in your foot? Right, um, and we do see a lot of that. Um, the most common tendonitis we see is called posterior tibial tendonitis or tendon dysfunction. And that's the tendon that's responsible for supporting the arch. And patients that have a posterior tibial tendonitis will sometimes notice that their arch is starting to flatten on the one foot. And they usually get some pain on the bottom of their heel or up into the side of their ankle. Mm -hmm. I should show you on the model here, like kind of right up and through this area. That tendon is responsible for supporting the arch, so when that tendon doesn't work, the arch just collapses. 
and that's called posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. And there's a lot of things that we can do to treat that conservatively. Uh, the most effective thing is usually uh, custom foot orthotics to provide a better uh, bed of support for the foot when you're walking. So orthotics are useful for more than one foot disorder. Absolutely, yeah, and that's, um, they're custom made, so it's not like they come out of a box and they're meant for one thing. If we have a patient with a really high arched foot, we can make some modifications to the orthotic to make it work for them, and if we have a patient with a really flat foot, we make some modifications to the orthotic uh, for them because it's all custom made for your foot. So how do you make uh, orthotics, or how is that process done in your office? Yeah, um, there's a lot of different ways to make orthotics. Uh, in the past, what we've done is we've um, used plaster and made a mold of the patient's foot. Some of the newer technology that's out there, we actually have a digital scanner in our office. And you step on this scanner, and it's like a glass box, and it scans the bottom of your foot. And then we can look at the plantar pressures up on a monitor and we can discuss your pathology and you can usually see um, where the pathology is occurring. If there's too much pressure in one spot, you'll see a, a red hot spot occur. The computer sort of calculates what your neutral position should be okay. and it sends that information to the lab which we use is out in California. They replicate a three-dimensional model of your foot. So they have a model of your foot, they flip it upside down, and then they heat up different materials like plastics, polypropylene, and graphites, and vacuum press it to the model of your foot. So it's a custom fit when you get it in our office. How often do people need them replaced? Orthotics are good for you know several years. It really depends on the wear. <clears throat> um, some patients uh, you know can go five to ten years. I've seen with a pair of orthotics. Some people like my runners who wear them all the time and are really tough on them. You know, more like two or three years. And then every once a year, we can replace the top cover if we need to, but that's, that's you know, no big deal to do that. Hmm. All right, the next thing to talk about <clears throat> is plantar fasciitis. Right. Do you want to describe what that is and sure. how it's treated? Sure, yeah, and it kind of goes right along with orthotics because that's probably the number one thing that we treat with orthotics is plantar fasciitis, the number one thing that we prescribe orthotics for. Um, plantar just describes the bottom of the foot. So, like, if you have a wart on the bottom of your foot, it's a plantar's wart. If you have a fasciitis, which is an inflammation of a ligament or the fascia on the bottom of your foot, it's called the plantar fasciitis. So, it's an inflammation of a ligament on the bottom of your foot. And basically, it's a band of connective tissue, and it runs from your heel up to uh, the ball of your foot. And what happens is when the arch collapses, that ligament overstretches. And it's really just a, um, an overuse condition. Mm -hmm. And when that ligament stretches, it overstretches so much that you can get uh, little microscopic rips and tears within the plantar fascia. That causes inflammation, which causes pain. Um, bone, it's important to note also that bone is, is living, growing tissue. And bone will grow in the direction that it's being pulled. So as the plantar fascia pulls on the heel bone, eventually calcium gets laid down in that area and we'll take an x-ray and we can see a heel spur or a little spur growing right off the plantar fascia. And that's not necessarily a problem by itself, but it's just a sign that there's a, there is some increased tension in that area. But what, what kind of diagnostic tests can, can see problems in either ligaments or tendons? Is it an MRI? What, what would do that? Uh, eventually, it, it, it is an MRI, uh, but that we don't jump to an MRI on every case that comes in with plantar fasciitis. Um, typically, we can do all the diagnosing that we need with a uh, with an X-ray, which is done right in the office. Okay. Um, and um, in severe cases where patients aren't getting better, or more often in the posterior tibial tendon dysfunction that we talked about earlier, uh, we may order an MRI in those situations to see if there is actually a complete tear or a partial tear within the tendon. Hmm. Okay, next we talk about heel pain. There's so much to cover, right. isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> there is, yes. Um, <clears throat> this, you know, this is plantar fasciitis. Sometimes patients call it heel pain syndrome. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about etiology and what causes it, um, treatment options. Once we do realize there's plantar fasciitis, typically um, we'll start the patient maybe with a strapping in the office, a Lodi strapping, which is a taping that we use. And that sort of simulates what it feels like to have some really good support. And I've had some patients come in, you know, limping in, and after we tape them up and talk to them a little bit about stretching, they walk out and they feel just tremendously better having some support because mm -hmm. they're not in the right shoes or their arches are really flat and they have no support. 
Um, we'll look at the shoes that the patient's wearing. You know, we want to get them into like probably the best thing for most foot conditions is going to be at the athletic sh athletic sneaker or a lace up shoe, um, and, and you know, with a pair of white cotton socks just for support. Um, you know, too many patients coming in, you know, like I said, these days with flip-flops and, you know, you know, boat shoes or just walking barefoot around the house. There's no support and it just stretches out that plantar fascia too much mm -hmm. and causes pain. Hmm. Um, it, you know, we'll usually start patients with anti-inflammatories like Motrin or Advil or some prescription strength anti-inflammatories. And if they still have pain, occasionally we will inject a cortisone shot into uh, the area surrounding the plantar fascia to decrease inflammation. And that's kind of like taking Motrin and kind of sticking it right where you need some relief. So that's very effective. And those, those are the patients that usually step out of the chair and say, this feels tremendously better immediately. Hmm. Um, in severe cases, there are some surgical procedures that can be done for plantar fasciitis. But the good news is that 80% uh, of patients that have plantar fasciitis get better without any type of surgery or any procedure. Only 20% of the patients that still have pain after you know, four to six months will even talk about procedures. Interesting. Yeah. Um, you've talked a well, little bit about arch problems. Um, either it's too high or it's too low. Um, you want to go into a little bit more detail about that? Sure. Um, there's, you know, a high arch foot is um, called a cavus foot type, or it, or it may be classified as a supinated foot, a, a foot that's got a very high arch. And the problem with a high arch foot is it becomes like a rigid lever. When it hits the ground, it tends to hit real hard. It hits hard underneath the heel and hard underneath the ball of the foot. These are the patients that, these are the kind of people that when they're above you in an apartment complex, you hear them walking. Uh, they, they hit the ground very hard. Mm -hmm. And if you look at their foot, they may have some callus underneath the heel and some callus underneath the ball of the foot and the arch it feels baby soft because that part of the skin has never contacted the ground. This is in contrast to a pronated or a flat foot that tends to hit the ground with the entire surface of the foot. Um, neither extreme is good. Both extreme has their problems. Right. You really want to be somewhere in the middle and if you're not, something like an ortho orthotic will help to bring you there. If you take your foot, if you go to a swimming pool and your foot is wet and then you walk along this cement, you can usually see an imprint of your foot. Okay. You know, and in a real flat foot, you'll see your entire foot on the imprint. In a high arch foot, you may just see the heel and the ball of your foot and you may not see anything in between. Ouch. Yeah. Ideally, what you want to see is probably about a third of the midsection of your foot hit the ground. Hmm. All right. And you've uh, supplied a photo of um, somebody with a flat foot, right? Um, yes, I did. Um, basically, PTTD. Yes. Um, that goes along, like we said earlier, the patient with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, um, that posterior tibial tendon is responsible for supporting that arch. So when a patient comes in, they complain of ankle pain, we'll look at them stand, we'll look at them walk, and we can see that the arch is starting to fall. And then if you look from the back, and that's a posterior view, you can see from the back, the, the rear foot or the heel bone is everted, it's kind of tilted out because hmm. that tendon just can't bring it back to center. And um, that was a good photo because uh, we, we and when typically what we do with those patients is, you know, we'll treat them conservatively, but if all else fails, there's some procedures that can be done to try to tilt the rear foot back into a normal position. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, now we talk about arthritis. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, that's more of a common ailment, right? Very common. Um, in fact, I was just operating this morning on a woman with arthritis in her big toe joint. Um, hmm. Arthritis can affect any joint, you know, people get arthritis in their hips, their knees, their shoulders. Uh, your foot has, you know, like I said, 33 joints in it, mm -hmm. and each joint could be prone to arthritis, but most commonly um, it's at the big, jo big toe joint, which is uh, right where the, the big toe joins the metatarsal. That's the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. In order for normal motion, for normal walking, your big toe has to be able to bend 65 degrees up. Okay, if this is like 90, that's like 65 degrees, okay? That's pretty far. Yeah, and most patients are a little bit limited, but some patients are completely limited. You go to bend their toe and they get like 10 degrees and that's all they have. Usually because they have a big bone spur on that first metatarsal head or a big bone spur off the base of the proximal phalanx. Um, what, and this starts usually as trauma. 
it's usually trauma, um, a small, you know, an old football injury. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll see guys that are 65 years old that said, yeah, I injured it when I was 16, but I didn't think much of it, but it's gradually beginning more and more painful. And what starts as a little crack in the cartilage uh, progresses to a larger crack in the cartilage, and then the end of the metatarsal should be a white glistening surface, almost like a pearl. And when we do surgery on these patients, when you open them up, that pearly substance is a little bit on the bottom, maybe 25%, but 75% of the, the head of the metatarsal is raw bone. That pearly cartilage surface uh, has been totally worn away. And so when they go to bend that toe, they, they have no chance of getting that 65 degrees of, of uh, dorsiflexion. Um, and there's some great procedures we can do for that. You know, sometimes we'll just go in there and clean out the spurs, but now there's actually <coughs> metallic implants that we put into that joint where we can cut away some of the bone and put a metallic implant. Um, in some cases, we'll actually fuse that joint, which, <coughs> you, you know, it certainly doesn't allow you to bend the toe, but it eliminates the pain. And with some of these patients, they just can't bend their toe anyways, but they're in tremendous pain. Mm. All right, now I went through and took a tour of your office, and yes, you showed yeah. me some of the mm -hmm. um, equipment that you have. Do you want to talk about um, what kind of state-of-the-art equipment uh, podiatrist offices can have? Sure, yeah. Uh, we mentioned earlier the digital scanner, and that's a that's, uh, thing that's uh, really picking up. <coughs> if you go to a lot of the uh, podiatry conventions, which I go to, um, there's, there's sometimes a variety of different scanners and it's just a new way to make orthotics and it's um, computer generated and I think the patients like it because they can view the monitor and they can actually see what's going on with their foot type and you know I can tell them they have a flat foot but when they look at that monitor and they see you know red and blue images all the way across their foot it really helps to clarify it for them mm -hmm. also if we have a patient like a diabetic who's prone to an ulcer they have a, a dropped metatarsal we can see that immediately on the scanner so that's been helpful um, as far as state-of-the-art technology, we have a digital x-ray now in our office, which a lot of doctors are having. You showed me that. It was just so incredible yeah. to watch the contrast move from black to white back to black again. Right. It's, inc it's amazing because, you know, sometimes, you know, in the old view boxes, we would hold the x-ray up to light and, you know, look with a magnifying glass, try to really make sure we're not missing a stress fracture. But now we just, with a click of the mouse, we can zoom in, zoom out. We can change the contrast. We can flip it. We can do anything we want with the image. And it really, it eliminates the, uh, it really can eliminate errors because of that, because, you know, you can yeah. just see so well. And plus, it's better for the environment, too. We used to have developer and fixer and, you know, all these chemicals that we use. Now, there's no chemicals at all. And also, patients can get a CD of it if they want to look at it or show their friends. Or um, if we have, a, if I ever had a question, I've had some cases uh, where I'd want an input from another specialty. I can just email an X-ray to the to the other doctor, and we can consult about it. Now, do you keep all of uh, the uh, images on a server, yep. or do you actually keep the hard copy with the, in the patient's file? No, everything's on the server. Everything's so on the server, which less is storage nice. needed. Less storage, yeah, and we can find them quicker. We're never, you know, sometimes you're looking for a, a file and you can't find that patient's x-ray, it's misfiled. Everything is on the hard drive. I can pull it up within five seconds. Okay. Uh, so that really makes it nice. All right. Anything else we forgot Anything about uh, in your office? Uh, we, off, we also have PVR machine now where we can actually uh, get a digital printout. We can do a vascular exam in, the, in our office for patients who may get cramping in their legs or patients with poor circulation. Um, we can get a digital, we put, do a 20 minute non payful, non invasive test where we put blood pressure cuffs on your legs and we can uh, get a black and white assessment of your circulation. We can look at the waveforms and uh, we can get a printout and a readout. And we can, we, we uh, have a vascular specialist that reads those uh, studies and we can share those with the patient's primary care doctors also, which is a nice uh, added thing that we've added to our office. Okay. I think that's about it. <laughs> All right, and lastly, let's talk about um, what shoes you recommend and what shoes we should throw in the dumpster. <laughs> Um, you know, I always recommend an athletic sneaker and white cotton socks to most of my patients, you know. Um, with the women, I know they like to wear the high heels, and uh, I think it's okay for limited use, but the problem really occurs in these women that wear high heel shoes on a daily basis, because over time, 
it actually can start slow can mildly shorten your Achilles tendon because you're lifting your heel so high up off the ground. Mm -hmm. So you really need to stretch out your calf and your Achilles tendon if you're going to wear high heels for a long period of time. Um, also, and you know, along with the high heels, that narrow toe box, especially patients that are prone to bunions, if you're wearing that narrow toe box, it's pushing your big toe over, it's just going to make that bunion that much worse. Um, and then for the kids, you know, I see everybody in the Crocs and flip-flops and stuff like that, and you know, these shoes are probably okay for going to the pool, and that's about it. You know, I hate to see, you know, when I see kids outside playing and they're running around in like flip-flops, there's just no support and there's no protection. And so really a sneaker is the best thing. Okay. So now we've done shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing we just want to mention is um, your web page and how to contact your practice. Okay, great. Yeah, um, we have a website. It's albanypodiatry.com. Pretty mm -hmm. easy to remember. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of videos and patient education up there. And uh, my office is, I have a private practice right behind Stuyvesant Plaza on Executive Park Drive. And, you know, we're always taking new patients. And uh, I think you have uh, our phone number there, 482-4321. And I'd be happy to, you know, answer any questions anybody had. If they just had a question, they can get me on the phone. Okay. Thanks very much. For All right. Time. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time on Focus on Health.